Does it look like I just woke up? Because I did. The Sony, I don't even know what this thing is, SSCS3 or something like that, tower speaker, retails for about $400 to $500 per pair. You can get them directly from Amazon, or you can go to Best Buy, actually, and buy them today if you wanted to. There seems to be at every Best Buy that I've been into thus far. In my listening, I was doing close wall, far wall, 10 feet away in a room that's about 17. I think it's about 17 by 17. I haven't measured it exactly in a while, so I don't recall, but it's about that size. I played around with aiming, putting it directly at me, towing it away from me. Uh, the amplification that I used was actually an old Denon AVR, but then I also used a Macintosh MC462, and that thing is a powerhouse. I'm sending it back, but that thing's a powerhouse, and it's fun just to play around with something that has 500 watts on tap for speakers like this, because hey, why not? The Sony Towers, very resonant, very boomy in some vocals, very hollow in some vocals. It doesn't matter what genre of music you listen to. It doesn't matter what movie I watched. It's kind of across the board. And the real issue isn't that there's just a couple resonances here or there that you could fix via EQ. The problem is that there are resonances that are back to back to back to back to back. And fixing that with modern EQ, such as maybe your Odyssey XT32 or your Dirac Live or something like that, it's not really feasible. You can manually equalize it with something like a mini DSP HD, but I would venture to guess that the majority of people who are buying the speaker probably aren't going to go out and spend an extra $200 on a DSP and then additional money for amplification for that DSP and basically running the speaker's quasi-active, if you will, where you have a channel dedicated to each speaker. I imagine most people are probably going to be running these off of AVR, and that AVR's built-in equalization just isn't going to be up to task for properly equalizing this speaker, which then leaves you with a whole lot of resonant, boomy, hollow, unnatural, and just poor sound. If you put the speaker close to a wall, those resonances that I talked about in the lower mid-range, mid-bass area, they're going to become more problematic because as you put a speaker closer to a wall, that increases the low end. Sometimes that's to your benefit with certain speakers. But with a speaker like this, I don't think that's going to be helpful to you because there are already multiple resonances in the pass band from 100 hertz to 600 hertz. When you put it near a wall, you're going to create some boundary reinforcement issues. Basically, the wall behind the speaker is going to have a reflection come right back at you. It's going to be a little bit delayed in time, and that's going to create a dip and a peak response, and it's going to go like that until it basically falls off. That is going to increase the already numerous peaks and dips in the response of the speaker itself. So when you put it in the room and you put it close to a wall, you're gonna make those issues even worse. And then there is no way at all you're gonna be able to equalize that speaker to sound anything close, anything resembling a neutral speaker. Now, is that fine with you? Hey man, I don't know. And you probably already own these speakers and you're probably watching me and you're like, you have no idea what you're talking about. But just keep in mind that, like I said earlier, I've reviewed about 200 something speakers at this point. I've been doing this for well over 15 years, tuning different systems. I have a pretty good idea of what I'm listening for. It didn't matter if I listened to Tears for Fears. It didn't matter if I listened to Boston. It didn't matter if I listened to Amy Winehouse or Rascal Flats or Allison, Allison? Alice in Chains. How about that? Allison Krause was what I was going for. Her last name just escaped me. It didn't matter if I was watching Bad Boys 2, favorite movie of mine. If you've got a daughter, then you probably know my favorite scene in Bad Boys 2. And if you don't, then you may still know my favorite scene in Bad Boys 2. Let's see here. I started watching True Detective on HBO recently. I was using these speakers. I watched the entire season one with these speakers. There were a couple times where I just switched back to the sound bar that I'm using in my home, in my living room setup, because it was just, it, the sound bar sounded better in terms of dialogue and clarity than these speakers did. And I'm not kidding. That sound bar, it's a JBL 5.1 or the bar 500 or something like that. I'll try to remember to throw up a little screenshot here. And I think I paid $300 for an open box one from Crutchfield uh, about a year ago. That little sound bar sounds better 
than these two tower speakers. Honestly, at least in terms of clarity. If you just want something that makes sound and you are on a budget and you're like, dude, I don't care if it's perfect. Okay, well, this speaker still isn't not perfect. It's far from perfect. Is it reasonable? Mm, it makes sound. Are you looking for any sort of realistic accuracy? That's a question to you. I can tell you that this speaker isn't going to be it, but I'm not trying to poo-poo all over it. I'm just trying to bring you the facts and be honest with you about what you can expect if you already own them or if you're planning on buying them. Do I have an alternative for you? Not right now, not in this price range. I would honestly, I would just recommend getting some bookshelf speakers and using a subwoofer. That's what I would recommend. Because here's the deal, with this tower speaker, you're still gonna need a subwoofer. It doesn't really get into subwoofer frequencies. Actually, it doesn't get into subwoofer frequencies at all. So you're still gonna have to use a subwoofer if you want those lower frequencies. Now on the positive side, I mentioned it briefly a second ago that the higher frequency, upper mid range, upper treble area is better in response. It's a little bit more smooth and it does take well reasonably to equalization above like two kilohertz. But that still just leaves me with the mid range. It's like I'm trying to find all these things that I can say, hey, it's still all right. But honestly, man, the mid range is just so bad and it's so resonant. It's like all over the place that it was annoying to me. My guess for all these resonances are probably poor enclosure bracing and poor enclosure stuffing. Now, without taking this thing apart, I, again, I can't say for sure, but this has all the symptoms and the classic symptoms of having really poor attention paid to the enclosure. And that's why you're getting a lot of enclosure based noise. Well, with all that said, let's start talking about some of the specs. The specs from the manufacturer are this speaker has a super tweeter, it's a three quarter inch super tweeter a one inch regular tweeter and two five inch mid woofers. And that's about it. That's about all the manufacturer has for me on their own websites. Like they're not really even proud of the speaker. I don't get it. With all of my subjective impressions aside, let's look at the data because I would rather you have something to go on rather than me just telling you what I heard. I mean, it's cool to talk about what I heard and explain things but I am more of a data oriented person when I'm trying to review something because then you don't have to just take my word for it. You can have hard line data. All of the data I'm about to show you is captured using my Clipple near Nearfield scanner. It is a state of the art robotic device that allows me to get anechoic data of a speaker in a non anechoic environment. And this beats having to go and use the speaker in a $1 million anechoic chamber. I can just do this testing in my garage or my dining room where I have this thing set up right now. First up is the impedance data, which is a great place to go and get an idea for how good is this enclosure. All of these little issues I've highlighted where I say many resonances and have these little yellow bars, anytime there's a blip in these little, these little lines right here, that's an indication of a resonance. Ideally, what you'll have is just a smooth, constant line. It's not a line, it's a curve, whatever you want to call it. But anytime there's a little blip there, that indicates there's a resonance. So we've got one resonance, two resonances, three resonances right there. It's right next to the second one, four, five, six. We've got six resonances all below one kilohertz. Of course, ignoring the tuned port resonance. Yes, technically that's a resonance, but that's not what I'm talking about here. Here we have the frequency response and you see what I'm talking about, all those resonances. Here's a dip, there's a little peak bouncing off of it. That's That peaks, okay, whatever. Uh, go down here, another dip. Another dip, a strong resonant peak, uh, dip, peak, dip, peak, dip, peak. And there's a couple other resonances above that, not necessarily enclosure based. And we see it around at two kilohertz. And there's another one around four kilohertz and then around six kilohertz as well. But the main takeaway for me is that there's a boatload of resonances. Average sensitivity is about 88.6 decibels at 2.83 volts, one meter. F3 is at 72 hertz, F10 is at 39 hertz. I talked about equalization early on and I want to give you an example. Let's say that I have the ability to set equalization with a mini DSP HD, which has finer tuning capabilities than many of the AVR equalization or auto equalization. Let's say I had that capability. So I'm going to pull up REW Room EQ Wizard, and this allows me to set a mini DSP for target optimization. And then if I go in here and I say, okay, here's my filters plus the target curve. So the target curve is 
this blue line right here. I'm basically trying to smooth this response out and I'm trying to do it from 150 hertz to 10 kilohertz. And I so want to set a maximum boost of three decibels. So you can play around with some of this and, and kind of tweak around what you need. So for example, if I set my target at 88 decibels right now, and then I move that down, you can see all this stuff is moving. That allows me to bring this up a little bit more. So I'm going to rerun the target response. 81% of the response in the match range is above the target. Wow. Okay. That's, that's not really great, but I'm going to still let it do its thing. So it's throwing a bunch of filters at this and it's tried to create the target curve. Okay, cool. So now what happens when you have the response? Oh, okay. So between 150 Hertz, cause I'm ignoring this, I can actually somewhat flatten out the speaker with equalization, but it's very specific equalization. What do I mean when I say that? Well, we've got cues and a cue is basically the notch filter, how narrow it is. A cue of one is gonna be really broad and it's gonna cover many octaves. A cue of five is gonna be a little bit more narrow. A cue of 10 is gonna be even more narrow and 20 is like, you're basically hitting on one frequency, the more narrow you get. Narrow Q filters can have an impact on phase. And I'm not saying that's necessarily always gonna be a bad thing, but in my experience, sometimes too many narrow Q filters can create more problems than they solve. But the main thing is that narrow Q filters stacked back to back to back is gonna be hard to achieve with standard AVR auto equalization. This right here is the Q that we're using. With this case, your Q is at seven on some frequencies, five, seven, and then some broader ones. But pay attention to where they are. At 209, 3.4. At 299, six. At 349, seven. At 385, five. At 48, seven. What I'm saying is all of these filters, and I'll show you where they are, are targeting all these little peaks and dips back to back to back. Again, most auto equalizations aren't gonna fix all those resonances. So you're gonna be left with potentially a lot of boomy slash hollowness back to back. Not saying boomy and hollow are the same thing. They're completely opposite, but they're gonna be back to back to back. I know that because I tried it with my Denon AVR, which uses XT32 or Odyssey XT32. And it just, you know, it couldn't solve the issue. I could solve it with the mini DSP, but that means you're gonna to have to go spend even more money. And I'm guessing you're not gonna spend that much money if you're buying these budget-minded tower speakers. Let's keep it rolling. This is a CEA 2034 data set. Same thing you saw a minute ago with the on-axis response in the black, but here, listening window is in green. So I'm gonna go back and here we are, okay? Uh, a lot of resonances, There's a whole lot of resonances. ERDI is a good idea of how EQable the response is gonna be. So this speaker is EQable up into about, I'd say maybe two to four kilohertz or somewhere in that region. It's gonna be a little bit less EQable, but that's mainly because of the vertical separation between the tweeter and the super tweeter and the mid woofer below it. For the most part, this speaker is gonna be EQable above about one kilohertz. So above about right through here. Now the EQ I was talking about with the lower frequency stuff, I've already addressed that. That's gonna be much harder to do, but above that region, it's gonna be a little bit easier. Here's an example of a good speaker. Now we don't see nearly as many resonances. If I go back, you got this big dip and big peak and dip and peak. You don't have that with this speaker, okay? Keep moving. Estimated in-room response. This is a good idea of the overall timbre and tonality of the speaker aimed at directly at you, zero degrees in black, or sitting flush maybe against the wall, not flush, but out into the room, but parallel with the wall behind it at about 30 degrees aiming, okay? So assuming that you've got like a 30 degree triangle going on, these are the responses. Overall, for the high frequency above 1K, it's actually not that bad. A mild dip from two to three kilohertz, it's not that bad. But again, we've got all these issues going on through here. This is an example of a good speaker where there just aren't those issues on the lower end and it's smooth and falling off at a decent rate on the top end. This is the beam width or the radiation horizontally of the speaker. So the sound that's going out into the room. Ideally, this is kind of what you're looking for. Something that is more linear through its beam width where the radiation is even into the room, no matter the frequency. And if we go back and look at the Sony, we can see that from one to two kilohertz, there's about a 10 degree swing. And then two to three kilohertz, there's about a 20 degree swing right through here. And then at around four to five kilohertz, there's about a 
another 20 to 30 degree swing and then more swings. Basically what this is showing us is that the sound that's, that's sent out into the room isn't sent out evenly at all frequencies. So it's not gonna be 60 degrees wide from 200 hertz to 20 kilohertz. It's gonna be 60 degrees and then maybe at two kilohertz, it's gonna be 40 degrees. And then maybe at five kilohertz, it's gonna be 60 degrees. And then maybe at seven kilohertz, it's gonna be 30 degrees. It's basically, <laughs> I hate to say it, but it's almost like it's random. And the problem there is that when you're listening to something and you expect maybe a vocalist and then something else is stacked on top of them, some toms, uh, a shaker, a cymbal, a guitar, it doesn't matter, any instrument, any sound, if they're supposed to be co-located at the same point, maybe, 60 degrees off axis, well, each of them carry a different frequency that's fundamental to them. So a vocalist, maybe that's 200 to 300 hertz. A cymbal is gonna be a little bit higher, so maybe 10 kilohertz. A shaker, I don't know, maybe eight kilohertz. And then you've got horns or something like that, maybe two to three kilohertz. The issue is that those sounds are gonna go here, 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 here. And as they're reflected off the walls and then bounce back out your ears, you're gonna go, all right, well, none of these sound like they're coming from the same space. I'm closing my eyes. They're sounding like they're coming from different spaces. That's the problem with radiation that is not more uniform like you saw in this example. So this is a good example. And the Sony would be a poor example of uniform radiation. The same thing kind of applies to vertical, but we're less susceptible to vertical delineation. Meaning that, you know, if there's a broad range of sounds that maybe aren't perfectly aligned vertically, it's not as noticeable because your ears stand up like this. Your ears aren't turned sideways. And as long as you are on the primary listening axis, which in this case I put at the, I think the super tweeter, I think, or the tweeter. But as long as you're somewhere in that tweeter axis, you're gonna be okay. But if you go above or below that tweeter axis, then the sound shrinks to about five, to maybe 15 degrees, depending on where you are, which means that if you are sitting in a chair that's a few inches above the tweeter line and you're eight feet away, well, you're gonna be off axis by maybe five inches or five degrees or so. If you're sitting 20 inches above that tweeter line, because these are relatively short tower speakers, then maybe you're gonna be 10 or 15 degrees off. What that means is that the high frequencies and the mid-range frequencies, you're not going to hear those as well as you do the lower vocals. So that's where speech intelligibility falls into play. So make sure that if you own these speakers, you're right on line with that tweeter, super tweeter area. You don't want to go too far above or below that. Make sure your eyes are lined up with that region. Distortion at 86 decibels, 96 decibels. Actually, the distortion, it looks pretty good. Two five and a quarter inch woofers, they seem to do the job in terms of distortion. What about multitone distortion when you're listening to sounds that sound like actual music? It's very multifaceted in its richness and its content spectra. Those are cool words, right? Speaker looks pretty good. I mean, you know, it's below my personal 3% threshold. If you use a subwoofer, you do decrease that mid-range distortion a little bit. What about compression? Compression on the speaker, I actually am surprised. I thought it would be much, much worse. I thought it would just kind of go all over the map in the mid-range, but in the mid-range, it's within about a decibel, even at the highest output volume. And then once you go below 80 hertz, you just increase in distortion a whole lot. And so you add more output, but it's not the good kind of output, if you want to call it that. Again, I would recommend using a proper subwoofer crossing over at 80 hertz and maybe even 100 hertz if you really, really want to increase the dynamic range of the speaker but I don't think you're gonna have any issue with the speaker getting loud. It's just gonna be that its linearity is very poor. So the issue in your hearing is gonna be due to the frequency response and the radiation pattern of the speaker, not so much distortion or compression. So that wraps it up for this review. I appreciate you watching and I hope you learned something. I hope you appreciate kind of what I'm presenting to you here. If you would like to support this channel in any way, I have generic affiliate links in my comment section or the description section below. Alternatively, you can join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. And, you know, affiliate links, Patreon, PayPal donations, all that really allow me to keep doing what I'm doing and pay for things like this. Uh, these speakers were drop shipped to me by a viewer, but I covered shipping my way. And uh, I don't know what he's going to tell me to do with them. He may have me ship them back, but we'll see. 
With all that said, I'm out. Talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.